Good morning, family. I know, I know everything's so nice and quiet this morning. Um, Calming, yeah. Well, the storm, that's right. The hurricane. That's okay. We're gonna be. It's gonna be awesome because God, God's gonna take care of everything. But it's nice to. It's nice to just be quiet once in a while. Just to stand and just be silent, peaceful. And like you said, that's it's the calm before the storm. Because God is gonna, God's, we're asking Him to come into this place and just meet each of us at our needs today in this place. Um, you know, we go through things, like I said, we go through things all week long. And to just pause for a minute, pause for a minute and listen and just wait on Him. That is so awesome. And I know that we get to do that in our own peaceful times, in our own private times at home, in a car, whatever. But here at church, together, with, with like-minded people, like-hearted people, loving God, to just be able to come and just to sit for a minute and just wait on Him and pray together. Beautiful. It's beautiful to have that peace and that comfort. Let's pray, guys. Find your hands, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. We thank you for this gorgeous, beautiful day that we have today, Lord. We thank you for the people here, Lord, that we can come together, Lord, and just wait on you. Just wait on your presence, Lord. We ask that you, you come into this place, Lord. That you fill each one of us, Lord. That you be with us today and every day, Lord. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit follows each one of us, Lord, and we ask for forgiveness, Lord. We ask for forgiveness for each of our sins, Lord, and may we each have a fresh anointing, Lord, a fresh awakening. Lord, may our faith grow and grow in you, Lord, and may our, may our knowledge of you, Lord, may our just everything, Lord, may everything in each one of us grow and worship you, Lord. Lord, again, we ask for your presence in this place today, Lord. We ask that you accept this time of worship, Lord, as we give it to you, God. We ask, Lord, that everyone here, Lord, open up our hearts. And may our hearts be ready to receive you, Lord. Lord, we thank you again for everything that you do every single day, Lord. Every single day in each one of our lives, Lord. Lord, we know that there's a lot of people hurting, Lord. There's a lot of people hurting. And Lord, we ask that you bless them, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you bless them and that you comfort them and you give them rest. Lord, I ask, Lord, that anyone sitting at home, Lord, that you stir it in them, Lord, stir it in them to, to get into your presence, Lord. Get into your presence. Even if it's at home, sitting by themselves right now, Lord. Lord, I ask that you speak to them, Lord, and may they grab their Bible, Lord. May they turn on the radio, put on worship, grab the Bible, read. Lord, I ask that you press into them right now, Lord, and ask that they get into your presence, Lord, and stay in your presence Lord, as long as you want them to. So, Lord, again, I ask, Lord, that you accept this time of worship, Lord, and may we have an awesome and incredible day together, fellowshipping, and just being together in your name. Lord, may everything that is said from stage, Lord, comes directly from you, God, and not from us humans, Lord. But Lord, may we be, we be the vessel. Lord, we be the vessel that you want what you want to express to each person, Lord. And may someone today, Lord, may someone receive. Receive exactly what you have for them, Lord. Lord, may you speak to them, Lord. May you touch them, may you show them visions, Lord. So that more and more and more and more and more our faith can grow in you, Lord. Thank you again, Lord, for this day, Lord. And may we all worship today, Lord, with our hearts 100% ready to receive your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to do our family prayer this morning, and so if you could uh, please look up here. Uh, I will say this, this might be the last time we do this family prayer. This might be the last time we do this family prayer. But we're just going to change a few words at the end. 
So let's uh, let's pray prayer, family prayer this morning. Ready to begin. Jesus, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. Bless and protect Israel and the city of Jerusalem. God, heal our land and send us revival. Yeah. Our declaration, again, uh, our declaration is part of what you and I declare by faith, out loud, over our island, uh, over our people, and even over the world. And so we, you and I, are talking to the creator uh, of all things, the God above all things, and we're asking him, we're declaring his word to him. There's power in it. It's universal. Okay? And so let's say our declaration uh, together, ready, begin. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Awesome, 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 awesome. I'm going to start off by reading just a, a short journal, and that will kind of help prime where we're going this morning. Okay? But here in this journal, it says, uh, I'm just going to kind of pick it up where it is on page 25. It says, and to instruct a school of teachers on the Saturday previous. At the commencement of the year, 1833, our two out churches at Hakalao and Kuo, Puna, were dedicated to the great Jehovah. The former, uh, the more important field, uh, there being 16 or 1800 uh, people within two hours walk. One third or perhaps one half of whom usually attended there uh, is preaching in pleasant weather. At this church, we have preached on 14th Sabbaths at Kuolo. The public worship is conducted by us on 22 Sabbaths. Here, rarely over 500 attending. The principal recommendation for an outstation at this place is that we can, without difficulty, go there Saturday afternoon and return Monday morning. While there is no other place of our field where we can go advantageously to preach without being gone, several days. So you can picture in your mind what it was like. They're, they're recording your stories of going out to these places, you know, in the Pune district. But it says here, again, during the years 1837 and 1838, there was a great religious awakening in the church. On the first Sabbath in January 1838, 104 were received into the church, and 505 more on the first Sabbath in March. But on the Sabbath of July 17, 1838, there were baptized and received into the communion and into the fellowship of the church 1,705 new members. This was a great and solemn and glorious day, a scene never to be forgotten. I, Mr. Cohen, was alone with my family at the station at that time. My beloved associates, uh, Lyman and Wilcox, having gone to Oahu to the general meeting, these 1,705 I baptized in one afternoon, and on the same occasion broke bread to about 2,400 communicants. In selecting and examining the 1,705 candidates, I spent much time and care attended with many prayers and tears. I met them all personally five or six times, besides preaching to them often, collectively. During the tours which I made at Kilo and Puna in the months of July and August, I baptized and received to the fellowship of the church, 452 individuals. These were the chiefly aged, the sick, and the infirm, who had for a considerable time given evidence of regeneration, but who were too feeble to come to the station. For the consolation of these and the other aged and sick disciples, I administered the Lord's Supper at several different places through which I passed. And then it goes on to the actual the account of the actual explosion, the spiritual explosion that happened during those times. And I read those kinds of stories to remind us of where we are and what the significance of it is. And somebody could say, well, you know, how we've been hearing you say that over and over for many years, okay? For four years to be exact, because it was four years ago almost to the date that I landed here in the Oak, in obedience to what God spoke to me, okay? And I look back at four years and and as I arrived here in four years, and all the things that God showed me through reading the book, God of Light, God of Darkness, all the things that God has shown me, even in the Spirit as I've come here, okay? Now I can look back and say, man, I'm just as excited and just as determined to hear this word proclaimed, right? 
to hear it proclaimed today as I was four years ago. And I'll tell you why, because I see it. I see the power of God coming on people's lives. I see the power of God changing people's hearts. I see the people today in bondage, spiritual bondage, physical bondage, tied up in all kinds of things, crying for freedom, crying for freedom, deliverance, healing. I see, I see them crying out, even this morning, I, I look in the, the boys' eyes, these young boys who've been up all night, drinking and doing drugs, walking up and down the streets. And he looked at me this morning, and they said, Uncle, good morning. And then my heart broke. And that's why I was motivated to go out there and pray and proclaim freedom and liberty, again, over our people, over our land. And so I, I, this morning, it's fresh. I look in their eyes, I hear their cry, wow, God, God, just like you saved me, just like you had mercy on me, have mercy on them. Just like you saved and healed me and made me whole, may you heal them and make them whole. That you would give them a purpose and you would remove all the hopelessness and that you would infuse them, infuse them with hope and life, the power of the love of Jesus would touch them, even now. Yesterday, you know, the aunties that uh, prayed for a couple weeks ago yesterday came up and she said, you know, Papa, you look really uh, nice by the water. And if you know it's funny? It, it's funny because they always, they always tell me what I'm wearing. And I want to hear, I don't want to hear what I'm wearing. I don't want to hear, I look at the closet, I get my same five shirts, you know what I mean? I, 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 are you listening? I'm not paying attention to my wardrobe. Are you listening to what the Spirit is saying? And they don't. But Auntie comes yesterday and she says, you know, boy, uh, it's really nice when you're down at the beach. And I said, you know, like this, we go out to the beach the first Sunday of every month. And so the other auntie, there's two aunties, the other auntie seen me this morning. And she asked me the same thing. She said, you know, boy, I would, uh, we were talking about what God is doing, and, and she began to reassure me the spiritual things that God was doing in her heart. And she said, I'd love to come down one day. You know, because they see me, they see me around, right? And they hear, you know, they hear and see us on, on on television, but they, again, it's more personal than that. They, they, it's more, it's a relationship that we've had over the years. And so it was awesome to see Auntie today. So I don't know if you guys remember this, a couple weeks ago, we specifically prayed and uh, that prayer actually will air today. And so I told Dan, I said, when you hear it, when I'm up there, I'm not saying your names, but when we're saying, when we're praying as a family, that's who we're praying for. And she goes, please continue to pray for me. And I reminded Auntie of this, that she really loves the Lord. I reminded her of this, that Jesus is always on her side. Amen. You know, sometimes people make any kind of the kapuna. Make any kind, talk any kind. I would caution them in that. Because guess what? The Bible says that God is the defender of the widow and that he is the father to the fatherless. Be careful. Be careful when you make any kind, especially to the kapuna. Be careful when you make any kind to the keiki. They have, there's a God in heaven who is their friend, their helper, their protector. In Jesus' name. I really, man, my heart breaks because I, I do see them going through things. And it shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't be making any kind to the kapuna. We should be taking care of them and kukuing them and loving them, being gentle rather than coming and making any kind of papaka and fights and all kinds of stuff. So again, that's something that God has shown me, especially when Auntie asked me again to pray for her. Well, a lot of people, they, you know, you, you can see here, I put out this Hawaiian display, but I said the top five reasons we teach and talk about the history of the Hawaiians. The first is that we live in Hawaii. This is in the new slide. We've shared this before, but I, I want to bring it to the front of our minds, okay? We teach and talk about the history of the Hawaiians, one, because we live in Hawaii. Two, right, we remember and perpetuate, we keep alive all of those things. The third thing is we honor the faith of our kapuna. We see that all throughout scripture, we see this as an example, right? We say we are, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When they said that, what were they saying? They were saying, right, from generation to generation to generation to generation, there was a time, 
where a man named Abram met with Jehovah. He was a friend of God. And they had this conversation, this unique experience, and all of the world's blessings, according to Genesis chapter 12, would come through this man and come through that conversation. Okay? So we know that when we, when we look back at our ancestors, when we look back at our history, it's the same thing. We honor the faith, the trust, the dependence they had. Okay? In Jehovah, in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing is we have the privilege of sharing it with our Kikyokaina, or our future generations. You know what's so important? Everybody says, oh man, it's important to share with the kinky. It's important uh, to share with them all of these things. And they, everybody has their agenda with, and the reason why they're doing it. Okay? Picture this. Right? They're 1837 and they're 1838. And there were 10,000 Hawaiians. Men, women, and children gathered here together. Right? Here, just around the corner of Kalakau Park. Imagine what that would have sounded like. When everybody worshipped in Hawaii, when the word came forth in Hawaii, imagine the children sitting there, boy, looking at Tutu, looking at mom and dad, going, what? <laughs> imagine they're sitting there going, wow. And guess what? For generations, they, they adopted, they said, this is our way of life. This is our faith, this is our way of life. And we see it all throughout. I mean, man, wherever we go, we see glimpses of, reminders of those things. It's important. That you and I have the privilege of sharing, not yet, sharing our faith and our love and our devotion, our loyalty to God with the Kate Yokai. Okay? And then this last thing. We believe, and okay? we believe God will do it again. And we just put in that word Hanaho. What he did before, okay, he can do again. And we're going to see some of the scriptures that support and develop and ground this truth in our lives. Okay? We, we begin from the very beginning with Henry Okukaia, right, born in seven, approximately in 1792, died February 17, 1818. We've heard it specifically from his family, right? His, his family had come here and brought a very personal testimony to us. Share the pictures, all of it. You guys know the story. If you don't, you need to read both the books, the memoirs that have come out, uh, that, that were written from him, and uh, written about him from his memoirs, and then even the, the newer memoirs that were re-released uh, over this last year. So please, again, do your homework. Know your Hawaiian history, okay? And then here, this is a, a picture that we've shared before, but this is from Queen Kahumanu, or Regent Kahumanu. This is her Bible, printed in 1817 in London, England, presented by Karen Bingham in 1822. This is on display at Bishop Museum. This is a picture that I took. A lot of the times I've seen, not only seen most of the Bibles from our kings and our queens, but I've actually even had the privilege of holding them as well, if you guys know the story, and what, a, what an incredible privilege it was to open some of the elite Alivi's Bibles and see exactly what was written in it and things like that, okay? But I just, again, bring forth, this is our history. The Ka'ahuman Ka Chapel Bell is located there in Manoa Valley. Uh, it is today, where her church was, was by the Manoa Valley Theater. So you can go there today and uh, see the church bell and experience that. Even greater than that, uh, you know, one of the brothers here and I got to go to uh, Manoa and go back there and see the Hoa'ona and all of the things that came as we started to pray here in Manoa Valley. And what an incredible experience that was. Okay? This here is uh, the picture of uh, the Herb Kani, the painting that Herb Kani drew. Okay? And this is uh, Chiefess Kapiolani. That's the school that we have here. You know, there's two different Kapiolanis. There's Chiefess Kapiolani and then there's Queen Kapiolani. Okay? Chiefess Kapiolani was from Kaabaloa, very close and associated with Kaabamano. Then they did the trek from Kaabaloa there in Kealtikua Bay, all the way up into the volcano, and the picture and the painting tell out the story. After she came, uh, went here, she made her, as we read again in history, she made her trek to Hilo, then again joined the missionaries here uh, right around December 25th, or right around that time there in Pio Pio, right here where the Hilo Ironworks building is. And as they all came together, uh, you know, and, and she joined with what God was already doing through the Bible studies and through the church services, obviously, you know, God freed us from living in fear. Okay? God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love 
of power and of a sound mind. Any time that there is something associated with fear, you and I know that it's not God. Why? Because all through our scripture, he says, be not afraid, do not fear. Over and over again, he would speak against it. You and I are people, free to love, free to love. That's who we are, okay? As children of God, our greatest attribute isn't fear and manipulation. It is love, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Love, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's important that we walk in it. So here is the painting again of Chikas Kapilani, painted by her kind of here. It's an incredible story. Uh, some of you have heard it before, but I hope that we experience it in a couple of weeks as we go. Okay? Prince Jonah Kuhio, okay? Kalani Anaole was born March 26, 1871 in Poloa, the island of Hawaii. Like many Ali'i, the Hawaiian nobility or Ali'i, he was named after his grandfather, Kuhio Kalani Anaole, a high chief of Hilo. If you wonder why, we went the other week to uh, this park named after who? Kuhio uh, Kalani, right? Anaole, where right there on the other side of ponds, and we weren't there for a little Sunday and we prayed and all of that. Uh, you don't have to wonder anymore. This is exactly why we went there. It's because of our elite and their faith and, and the, the path that they have uh, made for us to walk in. Okay? This is a picture, it doesn't come out that good, but this is a picture of the famous uh, Old Stone Church, Kauai Hau Church, very sacred place to the Hawaiian people, but uh, it was this, uh, it's there in downtown Honolulu, and again, this is a picture of Ali'i Sundays, where they, again, where the Ali'i went to church, where they worshiped and prayed, and played worship, and all of those things were here in this holiday. Very significant place, again, uh, there are some resources, some of your family here today uh, were Kahu, was the Kahu at uh, this particular uh, house of worship. And so it's, it's awesome. We've talked about that before where you go in and they have actually have a plaque uh, there to, to honor your Ohana. And so again, I just bring that as a testimony, guys. It's not, it's not just like tourist type places. You know what I mean? I think today you go there and they, they come in, take pictures, go leave. And when you go in these places, you feel. You see Henry's picture. When you walk into Quiet Hollow Church, Henry's picture is right there on the left hand door when you walk in. A real big picture of it. And you feel hundreds and hundreds of years of their faith and their devotion. All of their work. They never like just make a fancy building. It was a testimony to how much they really love God. How much they love God. They're the ones who would cut the rock. They're the ones who would build them. They don't the Hawaiian people. Said, you know what, right? Many of them came from simple means, right? But we know that they wanted the house of worship to be something extravagant. And you know, the disco is a new experience. And it wasn't, it was just, it was a group of people coming together, expressing their love and devotion to God. And it's awesome. Very much, not much has changed. Not much has changed over the 100 plus years. Not much has changed. You go in there today, you'll very much sense that same anointing uh, and God's presence in that place. It's amazing. We know again that uh, coming up on July 31st, right? We call it the Loi Hoi Hoi, the Restoration Day. It's the 170th anniversary of that. We're going to talk a little bit about it this morning. We always have talked about it. If you've been with the Lord Chapel from day one, we've always talked about this. And the reason why is it's that Sunday that we can call forth those things that are. We call forth those things that are. What? The, the story. Why? Because it says, right, that truth, truth will stand the test of time. That's what it says in Proverbs chapter 12. Truth will stand the test of time. Truth always, always has a way to liberate people. And so a lot of times the enemy comes in and makes lies or sows these things. They're false stories. And then guess what? We deny them and believe them as truth. And we say all bound, bound and uh, pissed off and all these other things. Bound in all of these things like bitterness, hatred and all of these things. We're going to look at God's word and talk about the correct history of the Hawaiian people. So that why? So we can be free once again. We were by the ocean this morning. I wasn't held back from worshiping God. I wasn't going, oh, right, I should be doing this in front of me. No, 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 no. Long before there was ever a church building anywhere in Hawaii, God was worshipped. <laughs> Long before there was ever some church building in Hawaii, God was worshipped. 
And so as I was out there this morning, I said, man, God, thank you for the privilege, thank you for the history. That's why we started off just running out the gates. Because it's important that we, we, you and I, not only study for ourselves, but that you and I go and, and share with other people what it is. So that they too, they too can perpetuate the story. They too can hear about the great uh, people that we have, like Henry, Mokukaia, uh, Queen Kapamani, even the kings, you can read their personal diaries. You know, I can have Queen Louis O'Kalani's diary here. You can read all of their, their diaries and things like that. Uh, their journals will blow you away. Okay? This is a flyer that they made uh, for yesterday uh, there at Thomas Square Park. We'll talk a little bit about that. It was a flag ceremony at noon. It was there yesterday. I've seen some of the the pictures on social media, uh, I didn't see any of the video, but I did see a lot of the pictures that came from that time. And so it was a, it was a time where, again, uh, they were remembering uh, the significance of this day. It's the last Sunday of every July that they uh, set apart again this day for the, um, for the Day of Restoration and the significance of it. Okay? I'm going to just read one of the short stories. Uh, from one of the records. It says on February 10, 1843, Lord George Collin of Britain arrived on the frigate Carysport and using the threat of military might, he demanded a formal provisional session of the Hawaiian Islands to Britain. King Kamehameha III conceded to Paulette's demands to avoid bloodshed and he allowed the British flag to be raised in Honolulu. On May 10, 1843, King Kamehameha III, Deputy Minister, Dr. Garrett Carmelle and Judd resigned and bought the public papers of the king to the Royal Mausoleum in Nuuanu, Oahu, at Mauna Ala, the fragrant mountain, to keep them from being taken by British naval officers. Judd then used the coffin of the late Queen Ka'ahumanu as a desk as he wrote appeals to London and Washington for help in resisting the illegal activities of Paulette. Okay? So here's a picture, here's a picture of the deputy minister at that time. Here he is with the princes or who became kings. They're all right here together. But he was a medical missionary. That's why it says that he's a doctor. He was a medical missionary. And he came to help the Hawaiian people. As a matter of fact, when that happened, imagine the king's heart. The king, the king, right, when he was right, being manipulated by Paulette, when he was being threatened, right? And we see that both in the king and the queen's life. They said, hey, we don't want our people to die. Therefore, we believe in God, we believe in justice, and just trust it accordingly, okay? Instead of raising up arms, making, right, you that that was not the answer. Why? Because plenty of people was going to die, okay? So we said, okay, so here he is. He goes, okay, but this is what, it hurt him. You know, you can imagine how the king felt when this happened. How the people felt when this happened. Okay? And guess who, guess who God used? God used his medical missionary, he used John, to come in and have the, he had the wisdom to know these guys are going to come, take the papers, do all that. He had the wisdom to come, take the papers. He knew where to go. Where was the sacred place? On the Allah. Again, if you, if you have the privilege to go to Oahu and experience it, it's a very sacred and powerful place, right? It's one of the only three places that the Hawaiian flag flies all along. Mauna Ala, Luwana Avenue, just as you go up. Okay? So it's important that we know again our Hawaiian history, that we go there. Many of us, so we had a we had the privilege to go there one time. Some of the people uh, and I, some of the students I met. And then we got to experience God. We got to go there and sing praises and blessings and thank God for our Alini, right? Because all of the Alini is there except for two, right? One's in Kauai Hau, the other one is uh, God knows where, right? From Emmanuel, right? But we know this, you guys, as they're there, he had, the, he had the wisdom to go there as a place of refuge. Why would he have chosen that place? Why would he have done it in such a sacred way? Because all he knew, he knew, he knew who we put our faith in, what, what it was all about. He knew who Kaumamu's faith was in. I mean, that was absolutely clear. Okay? And so it was important, you guys, that we go and we learn these stories. One of the things that, that I had in my personal journey you know, I, I've actually had the privilege of going into the state archives uh, again. So thankful for Uncle Alex, who is now in heaven, but so thankful for the Kapuna for teaching me uh, where, how, and all those things to study and to learn and to be 
with, uh, with all of that, he led by the Na'al, not by the Apia. Okay. <laughs> but uh, he used Apia and the Na'al to do, uh, to learn great things. And so he told me, he says, you know, Chris, you need to go to the state archives. And this is what you need to look up. And so I've been in the state archives, looked through a lot of this, the paperwork. I actually uh, have a paper here. Uh, and it has uh, uh, Reverend Judd's signature on it. And it was actually from my teaching day. It was a handwritten letter uh, written back in uh, the early 1900s and even late 1800s. But this one has his actual signature on it, which I hold sacred to me and precious to me because of uh, the connection and, and who he is and how God used this man to help the Hawaiian people in a time of crisis. In a time of crisis. That he had the, the wherewithal to pull himself together, to get what he needed to help the Hawaiian people. Okay? So here it is, Dr. Chuck, the medical missionary. It's awesome. So grateful. It says on July 31st, 1843, the provisional recession of the Hawaiian Islands to Britain was rescinded by Britain's Admiral Richard Thomas who was sent by Queen Victoria to restore control of the Hawaiian Islands to King Kamehameha III. On Monday morning, July 31st, 1843, the Admiral issued a proclamation restoring the islands to their king, and incidentally mentioning in high, ter uh, high terms the work of the American missionaries. Okay? This is what it looks like today, Thomas Square. It was the first public park in the state of Hawaii, but there it is, you know, when I was uh, when I was a child, I used to play here. My mother used to take me and uh, play there. I remember the red ants. Uh, I'll never forget the red ants in Thomas Square. We'll just put it that way. Okay? This is a Google Earth picture of Thomas Square, right? If you go there today, if you guys remember, you know where McDonald's was over there, I mean, all of that, right? The Blaisdell Center, right? It's a really congested area, okay? And it's changed over the years. A lot of it has changed, it, but that, that particular block has kind of remained the same. The hospitals stay across the street, right? But here is a picture from Google Earth, and the park is designed like a Union Jack, okay? And you see that in the Hawaiian flag, we have the Union Jack, but here it is. It's, it's, the park is designed, laid out like a Union Jack again to honor uh, Admiral Thomas. Okay? Admiral Thomas and the suspended king proceeded thither in a carriage attended by the chiefs and vast multitude of people. The English standard bearers advanced toward His Majesty, their flags bowed gracefully and abroad. Beautiful Hawaiian banner exhibiting a crown and an olive branch was unfurled over the heads of the king and his attendant chief, chieftains. Thomas Square was so named and set apart as a perpetual park near the heart of the city in honor of this action of Admiral Thomas. Monday afternoon, the kings and chiefs and several thousand people gathered in the new native stone church, White Hollow, and held an uh, enthusiastic praise meeting. The king, in an eloquent speech, uttered a model worthy of the highest statesmanship. This was later adopted as the national model and inscribed on all Hawaiian coins. Perpetuated is the life of sovereignty of the land by its righteousness, or the perpetuation of the life of the sovereignty of the land depends upon the righteousness thereof. The church was beautifully decorated, and on the pulpit was the restored Hawaiian flag. Okay, here's again pictures. This is not the, the drawing of the actual procession, but it gives you an idea of what it was like. I think this is actually a wedding, one of the elite's wedding there in Kauai Hau. The stairs and all of the, the building and all of its majesty is still there. This again is a picture of the inside, and then there is the Hawaiian flag. But you can picture in your mind what it was like to be restored, right? To have the truth come in as a people, right? Where did they go? They went into the house of God. Right? John, who was eloquent and who spoke the wine, came up and in a level read everything that Queen Victoria said. And then King Kamehameha made that statement. It was a prophetic statement, but it was handed down to him, right, from generations. And we look back and even the history of that, coming from Ka'ahumanu and maybe even before. Okay? So we look at this. It was declared where? On the footsteps, on the threshold. Right? The entry of the house of God. By who? By the king. Telling his people what? Right? Man, because we cannot. We cannot do it. The life, the land. Right? The sovereignty. By what? 
my right limb, my what's wrong. Right? And they're in front of God's house. They were able to both side by side judge and command man the third. We were able to declare that and pronounce that. And again, it became, this event became a 10 day celebration in the Hawaiian kingdom for years to come. And it was very extravagant because you can imagine the people. It was like they celebrated every year this incredible act of restoration of God. Okay? Now you think about this in, in a more practical way so that people can understand. When God restores your health, how happy are you? Right? You don't just celebrate it once a year. For those of you who have been sick or in the hospitals, they all bust up, right? Life threatening kind of stuff. And then God restores your health. How do you act when God restores your health? Right? Eric, I can think about the many times we've been uh, in ICU, critical care, emergency, all of the above. Right? And I've been there. I mean, I've been there with you and your family and see. And I see how God has restored you. You don't need once a year to go, oh my God, I told you I walked out of the hospital and you were building the center. Woo! I'm going to celebrate. No. God restored you, Eric. You celebrate when? Every breath. Every single day. And it's this idea in our lives, right? God didn't just restore the health. He restored a people. He restored a faith. He restored an item. Oh, man. May God quicken and awaken that in us today. Right? We look around. It's like, wow, where is that? Where is that? Today in Hawaii. Ten-day celebration. Annual event. I'm saying it because I want God to call it forth. Okay? I want God to call it forth. And I'll tell you what my agenda is at the end of all this. Because everybody has all kinds of agendas. I seen one flag up there by the statue the other day. And I seen the uncles all sitting around. And everybody's having meetings and all those other things. Everybody has their agenda. The reason. But you know what? You know what the most important agenda is? If we're really going to honor the elite, not just singing their songs and saying their prayers and doing If we're really going to honor them, we're going to honor them by the way we live and by the way we love people. That's what our faith is all about. It's not about how well we know the Bible inside now. It's how much we live it. Right? It wasn't just decoration in the Bishop Museum on the third floor, Queen Kahumanu's Bible. Right? It was something she lived by. The first Hawaiian Bible was given to her as a gift. With her name in it. And it's for you and I today not to know this book, but to live it out. I hope, as a Hawaiian, I hope the Hawaiians do what I say in love. Because you know what? When I think about my tutu man and his handwriting and the letters, the so copies of his handwritten letters that I went in the archives of time, of his letters. And recently I shared it with one of the aunties. And she began to tell me, she goes, you know what, boy? I, I, I don't know. I don't read Hawaiian. I don't read all that. She, so she looked at these places and she's from all of And you know what she said? She says, Chris, you see all that list on the bottom? I said, yeah. She goes, those are valleys. Because I always knew that my tutu man was from Halam, or they ministered in Halam. All the names under that were valleys that went over and over. So I'm continuing to learn today. This is just a couple weeks ago when I came here. She said, you know what, boy, when you come to Molokai for the first time, you're going to meet all of these families that are in, on this level that you're to that Molokai. You're going to go to those places, go to those valleys. She said, bro, I would have liked some hiking shoes. <laughs> 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 uh, empty Jojo and, and the empties and uncles are there, they're waiting. God knows, I'm, I'm ready to go with he is to go into those places. But I see that, not in arrogance, not in pride. I, I said that, see that with great humility. And I see just as they would want, just as they have loved, just as they have lived out the world, so will you do. So will I do. I look at there, I look at what Kutu Man wrote, you know, gone to those places, and I think, wow, amazing. It's only right that we follow, that I follow in their footsteps. And it took me a long time to come to that conclusion. Okay? A long time. Because I was hot head. I know nobody else was hot head, but I was hot head. Okay? Again, there, Omao, Kiyo, Kaina, Pono. Thank you again, Eki, for bringing the testimony of uh, the. Uh, 
one of the people who wrote the Hawaii 78 song. Uh, Hawaii 78, you can go there and look it up. If you know, uh, you've heard the song, My Brother Is, and all of that, and what it means to the Hawaiian people. Go look it up for yourself. Study it yourself. That's why I put all these websites and pictures and all these things. I did all the study and made everything real easy for you guys to look that stuff up on your own and learn it on your own and understand the significance of it. So you guys know that we were recently with Uncle Dan, I'm not going to say his name, but I was with Uncle Dan the other week at the Bible study over there on the Eva, and I just going to see. Okay? We're always together. And he was with them last night. They were what? Worshiping Jesus. Right? Worshiping Jehovah. Worshiping the Holy Spirit. All together last night. There at Kamehameha. So nothing has changed. <laughs> you know, we're still saying the exact same thing. Even now, we continue to say the exact same things. And he did mention his name earlier, uh, Uncle's name earlier. The word again, restore, means to return something or someone to an earlier or better condition. Right? We know these scriptures, Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Come, let us return to Jehovah. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he, Jehovah, will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Something that God spoke prophetically over a specific group. The group was the people of Israel, and they have 2,000 years later, again, become a nation. We see them all the time, right? They were non-existent for 2,000 years. And God brought them back to life again prophetically. It continues, it says, let us acknowledge Jehovah. Let us press on to acknowledge Him. Not just to like, oh, acknowledge Him. To know Him. As surely as the sun rises, pay attention. This is as sure as the sun rises. Every day we go out, most of the time, if not cloudy, we see the sun come up. As surely as the sun rises, He will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Or in some of your translations, it might say like the spring and like the latter rain. We're not going to get into all that prophetic this morning, but it's important, again, that we say it over and over again. Not just here, but when we're out and about. These scriptures are for you, so you can open your Bible wherever you're at, and you can speak to those places and those things that God tells you to speak at with His Word. And allow His Word to be His Word. Right? Allow the living, powerful Bible to just have its way. Over your home, over your home, over your island, over our people, wherever you're at, pray those things. Get the Bible out by faith and pray those things. In Job chapter 2, again, speak, speaking prophetically, he says, I will restore or replace for you the years that the locust has eaten. Again, Job chapter 2. It also talks about the Holy Spirit there. Okay? In Job 42, at the very end of Job's life, when Job prayed for his friends, Jehovah restored his fortunes. In fact, Jehovah gave him twice as much as he had before. So he didn't just, God doesn't just restore you. Like he goes, okay, this is what was what happened. All this stuff, right? See, it says, I'm going to bomb Job's life. Right? And then he never just get back what Satan would bomb on him. Right? The Satan goes, hey, you know what, God? You know what, Jehovah? Job only followed you because you bless him. Job only followed you because all these wonderful things, you bless his life, you bless his family, you bless his business, you prospered him. He goes, man, if you curse Job, watch what he will do to you. And he goes, man, let Satan have to go and ask God permission. Let me go and touch Job's life. And Job said, you know what, I see Job's heart. He not going to curse me. Go try it. We'll test him out. And he did. With God's permission, he did and guess what? At the end of, right? Job 1 to Job 42. At the end of the book, at the end of that story, in Job 42, when Job prayed for his friends, top story with Jehovah, Jehovah restored his fortunes. Jehovah gave him twice as much as he had before. That is a word, that is a character in the heart of God. That what it was before is going to be twice as better in the future. As twice as better in the future. God doesn't just take and replace. He takes, if he allows it, he takes it as something, and he gives you even more. He gives you twice as much as you had before. And again, may you hear in your spirit what God is saying to you and I today. Thank you, God. This is a very uh, well-known verse, but it's in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. He says, Then if my people who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will restore their land. Whoo, man. I like it. In your translation, it might say heal. I like that in this translation, the New Living Translation, it uses the word restore. Because restore is something, again, it seems to be the theme, the thread that God keeps bringing forward over and over again to His Word. God is the God of restoration. Okay? This is a very powerful, 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 powerful picture. Pictures. One is of Queen Lili Okalani, and the other is of Regent Kahuma. Okay? And the paintings might be familiar to you, but I just, again, when I think about Henry Kapiolani Kahuma, when I think about that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's what it says in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, it's as if you and I today are with the pool. And we're standing out there, looking at Mauna Kea, looking at Hamakua, looking at the Southern Cross, looking at the horizon. And it's as we're taking it all in, the elements, all of God's elements, okay, in the spirit. We can sit here with them, because they're where? Where are these two beautiful women at today? They're in His presence. Because the Word of God declares that to be absent from the body is to be present in the Lord. But what are they doing? Right? What are they doing? Well, it tells you and I in Revelation 4 and 5. They're singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're worshiping the man in white with eyes like fire. They're worshiping Him. Okay? Guess what? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father doing what? Right? It says that He's interceding. He's pleading on who? On your half and my behalf. He's saying, God, look at what they're going through. He's calling us by me. And he says, look, look at what they're going through right now, my precious child. Look at what they're going through. And they're, he's there at the right hand of the Father. The Word of God declares, interceding, praying on our behalf. Well, I would imagine for our loved ones, for my tutu man, for my auntie Mike, for my uncle Kim, for the many others that have gone before me. Every single one of them in God's presence, right? I, I have a magnet on my fridge of a lady that I never even met in my life, physically. Kopeka, right? Lee, <laughs> right? Elizabeth Kopeka Lee, I have a magnet on my fridge that says Philippians. You know, it's on my fridge, right? Why? Because they're where? They're there. Henry's praying where? He never made it back to Hawaii, right? Until Debbie and Ohana bought his Evie back 20 years ago. But well, where has he been for 195 years? Uh, yeah, he's, he's been in God's presence. So when we stand with the great cloud of witnesses, it's, it's as if, it's as if we're all together. With one heart, with one voice. Say, God, would you please, your people, Hawaii, who are called by your name, the Hawaiians, will humble themselves and pray. Turn from our wicked ways, seek your peace. Then you will hear from heaven, forgive us of our sins, and restore our land. Right? And, and that word has a lot of different meanings to the Hawaiian people. I'm going to speak. I use these, these pictures of women that I, I love and adore, that I've studied and I respect. I use these pictures to share with my personal, again, this is my personal opinions and convictions. Today. Jesus said to his followers, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, so many times we're at this place, and, and you guys know because I've, I've been, you know, I'm Mr. Hawaii. There was never a time in my life where I wasn't, I didn't have the Hawaiian flag. I thought, uh, you know, Hawaiian tattoos and all that other stuff. I've been there, done that. I even thought Hawaiian was drinking high you know, <laughs> smoking. You know, that, that, that's what I thought. Right? I was raised where I rocked the Hawaiian. I thought, hey, bro, that's all, you know. But I've come to discover something way more powerful than our culture. Way more powerful. And what it is, 
It's a purpose. You see, it's our purpose. And the purpose of a life, the purpose of a life, will always go before even the people of a life. And I'll, and I'll say this scripturally, because I think that people would take my words and say any kind of stuff. I just want to set the record straight. Long before I was ever Hawaiian, my mom told me the other day some good news. She said, Chris, boy, you're more Hawaiian than me. And I said, Mom, thank you for the good news. But my mom is the real real Hawaiian, you know what I mean? Not the kind, she's the, not the percentage part. She got the love part from head to toe. She get them. I don't know that kind of Hawaiian, you know what I mean? Not yet, okay? But my mom shared it. I thought, you know what it is? God, I truly thank God for being born a Hawaiian. I really do. But even before I was Hawaiian, it says in Jeremiah, it says in Psalm 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Where? Not in Hawaii. From the heart and mind of God. Jeremiah 1 5, before you were in your mother's womb, before you had an ounce of DNA in you, Jeremiah, called Hawaiian, you were created as a child of God with an intention and a purpose. And you are now, Jeremiah. You will be called to a specific people to say a specific thing on behalf of Jehovah. We thought about that long before your blood type, long before your hometown, long before your mom and dad. You come from the heart and mind of God. And so many times today we're stuck. I'll speak again my personal conviction to my people. Okay? We're stuck. Where? I'm being Hawaiian. We were children of God long before we ever migrated here on our canoes. We were children of God long before there was a word or a flag called Hawaiian. And if we really want the key to get back to God restoring us and restoring our land, Jesus gave us the key. Seek first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. Isn't that kind of a sound bit? Isn't sovereignty really the kingdom, right? Not this kingdom, but the kingdom that will last forever and ever and ever, right? The kingdom that has the king of kings, the Lord of lords, right? That king, Revelation 19, 16, right? If we are in that kingdom, and we're about that kingdom, who can stop you? Right? Who can stop you? And so I say to the children of God, even for me specifically, to my own honey, to my dear feminine friends who are Hawaiian, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And everything that we want in our heart, according to God's word, shall be added unto you. See if both Kahumamu and Queen Liliopoani were here today in their Bibles, in the King James Version, because that's what they have, that's what their Bible, they would have said these exact same words to you and I today. They would see all of this agendas and hakata and all these other things and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. The real heart, the real love, was to work on. Their real allegiance was to who? Their real trust was in who? In Jehovah. In Jesus. In the Holy Spirit. And so may you and I today draw strength, encouragement, and hope from what they did. Never mind, you guys, all the other stuff. Never mind all that stuff. Never mind getting caught up in all this stuff. Long before the canoes came here, Right? Who do you think would guide the canoes only up? Right? From the heavens, reading everything. Romans 1, Psalm 19. Who do you think would guide us only up? Hawaiians. Yeah, come on. Long before we even recall that. Long before he knew. He knows. And he has, man. He has blessed us with this incredible, incredible gift called Lord. He has blessed Hawaii. You know when I'm down there and I see the tourists when I'm out there praying in the morning? I'm going to see grumpy tourists walking on an island. Everybody's like, honey, honey, 
uh, whatever language you speak, you know, they'll say, hey, you know, you know, when they go out there, they see you, know, hey, can you say something to me? And then, uh, you know, right? You guys know that. I don't see anybody all pissed off and grumpy all day. Right? It's important, you guys, that you and I remember again today that it's all about Him. And that we, that's what I'm saying, we're stuck on what we pause. I'm just so stuck on being Hawaiian. This thing that was wrong, we were wrong as a people. That's, not, that's public information today. Everybody know. Anybody who could, who would, who would learn the truth, who would like know the truth and not be ignorant or arrogant can learn from what the history, the true history of Hawaii is. And nobody would disagree. Right? That was wrong. Nobody would disagree. Unless you arrogant and all that kind of stuff. Okay? But you guys, we cannot be out there. Satan or the enemy and you know the album, whatever you want to call him. Okay? He has used that as a strategy against our people. And God wants to restore and heal us in the name of Jesus. He wants to make us alive and well again. He wants us to be whole and talk like we're whole and act like we're whole so that we can go whole other people. <laughs> we can go whole, whole people, right? Heal people in their mind, in their heart, in their spirit. You don't have to look around too far. You know people, you know neighbors, you know people who stay all bust up, tied up. It's all rooted to this. It's all rooted to these things. Satan has used a lot to deceive our people. And it's time for our people to be free. To be free. So that's on this day, on July 31st, which is going to come on Wednesday. On that day of restoration, I hope in my prayers that wherever you're at on that day, every year, that you would take these scriptures and whatever God puts on your heart to pray, whatever verses God puts on your heart to pray, and that you would go somewhere, wherever that somewhere is to you, and that you would proclaim the year of Jubilee, liberty and freedom over our people.